Hey everyone! First off, sorry for not being able to attend Flash Gam this year. I really do want to be there with all of you guys, but sadly I have other things to attend to right now. So while I'm not there, I went ahead and did the next best thing. I did a pre-recording of my speech, which you guys are going to be the first to view right now. So who am I? My name is Chris Benjaminsen. I'm a founder and the chief product officer for PlayerScale. We do backend as a service solutions for people who build games, but most people know us better from our open platform Player.io, which allows everybody to use our tools to build better web and mobile games. A large part of my job is helping developers make the best possible games using our platforms. However, I have found that most small teams actually have no problem using our technology. Their challenges revolve more around how to make money from their game and how to build a business. So I have wanted to create this speech for quite a while, essentially talking about what I learned working with hundreds of developers making the most of their games. The title of this speech is how to make a million dollar flash game. That is, however, a very lofty title. So let's start by limiting the scope a little bit. Let's instead look at how we can make a million dollar a year flash game. Likewise, there are many different ways you can make money from your game. You could monetize with subscriptions, in-game payments, advertisements, game licenses, pay to install, and so on. But for this presentation, we will focus on what I know most about, which is in-game payments. So we end up with a title that is how to make a million dollar a year flash game using in-game payments. As I only have half an hour, my goal today is to give you five simple rules that would highly increase your chance of building a million dollar game. To prove that these rules work, I wanted to give a real world example of a game that uses these rules very effectively. Luckily enough, the great people over at Con Artist Games has given me permission to share information from their game The Last Stand Dead Zone. Therefore, any specific number you will see in this speech will be from their game, but it is very representative of the market as a whole. The most common question I get from game developers is, how can I add in-game payments to my game? And the brutally honest answer to that is, you cannot. There is very little chance that your monetization will be successful if it's something you try to add to your game as an afterthought. Not having monetization being part of your design process is like not considering the graphical look, who the target audience is, or what device the game will run on while you design your game. So therefore, our first rule is design for monetization. In other words, do not write a single line of code before you know exactly how the game will make money. So not surprisingly, the most important component of making a million dollar game is revenue. Broadly speaking, we can define revenue as equal to average revenue per user times total amount of unique users. Let's first have a look at getting unique users. Even better, let's talk about how you get free users to your game. By far, you get the best users by word of mouth, having one of your users recommend the game directly to his or her friends. And you can even help this by giving them the options to share the game with links and emails. Then there is PR, getting on and offline magazines to talk about your game. And trust me, it's an amazing feeling when somebody has taken the time to sit down to play and review your game. However, in my personal experience, you should not expect to get a lot of users this way. Cross-promotion, on the other hand, works very well. Sharing users across multiple games, or even better, sharing users between your own games, it's basically free advertisement. And there's even services such as Am Amplifier that make sharing users very simple. Then lastly, there is social where you are assisting the word of mouth process by making it easy to share the game via social networks. Notice, however, the star here, not all social channels are free. For instance, if you want to make use of the friends list and graph sharing features on Facebook, your game must be a Facebook application. And on a Facebook application, you use Facebook payments for in-game transactions. And for that service, you pay 30% to Facebook. All in all, Free users are great when possible. However, unless you're not the creator of Minecraft, there's very little chance that you can get enough free users to make a living. 
This brings us to rule number two. Expect to pay for users. Even more so, make it part of your business plan and put it in your budget. So let's talk about buying users. The most expensive way you can actually do this is by getting a publisher. They will do research for you, they will buy the users for you, but they will also charge you a premium for doing so. Another option you have is to distribute your game on social networks and gaming sites, so Facebook and Congregate and Friends. They will be very happy to send users to your game, but they will charge you a share of your revenue for doing so. Even more so, there is no guarantee that you would get a lot of traffic by putting your game on these networks and gaming sites. You will only get a lot of traffic if your game is one of the games that make these networks the most amount of money. By far the method that gives you the most control is classical advertisement. Today you are able to buy a good user on Facebook for approximately 50 cents. You can buy a good user on mobile for a dollar and 50 cents or you can try buying a user using a general web advertisement or other channels and the cost there will be around 50 cents as well. So a good user is a user where the total value of this user is higher than the acquisition cost of getting that user. Sadly, there is no way for us to know how much money we are going to be making on every single user we acquire. We therefore have to make do with the next big thing, which is average revenue per user. What you're looking at here is a world map over gross domestic product per capita. So how much money do people on average have in each country? And what we found is that this is an extremely good measure for how well your game is going to monetize. Looking at the real numbers, it's therefore not surprising to see that the last stand dead zone makes the most amount of money per user in Norway. And as you go through the list, it's very apparent that the quote unquote rich countries are at the top of this list. However, I think it's worth noticing here that The Last and Dead Zone is only a game that can be played in English. And therefore countries such as Germany and Canada might have appeared higher up on the list had you been able to play the game in German and French. So you're probably having the same great idea I had the first time I saw these numbers which were, let's go make games for people in Norway. However, looking a little bit more at the numbers, it very quickly becomes apparent that that might not be the best idea after all. The reason for this is that even though Norway is a very rich country, it's also a very small country. If we instead look at total revenue per country, it's therefore very apparent that the total amount of users is as important as the average revenue per user. So assuming I'm correct and you will need to buy users, one of the most important things you need to know is what users to buy. And it's tempting here to simply go out and buy the users you designed your game for. However, my goal with the previous few slides were to show that it might not be as simple as that. Instead what you should do is to do what Conartist Games did and measure which users are the best ones for you. Figure out what country converts the best, figure out what age range converts the best, and figure out which gender converts the best, and so on. And this brings us directly to rule number three, which is don't guess, measure. And while we talked about this in the context of average revenue per user, you should really apply this to everything you do in your game, even down to something as simple as what should the color of the buy now button be. So let's talk about designing your monetization. While I was preparing this part of the presentation, I went ahead and I looked at almost 100 different games on our platform to see what generally works for people and what generally do not work for people. And what I found is that the following three strategies works for almost everybody. The first of these strategies is permanent upgrades. Some level of upgrade that the user is able to buy and is allowed to keep forever. However, watch out that you don't make your permanent upgrades too powerful. This is especially true for multiplayer games where a permanent power up can break the game and make it not fun for everybody who have not purchased the upgrade. A game that does this very well is League of Legends, where you can buy new heroes to play. The players get a new permanent upgrade when they buy a hero, 
but it does not feel like cheating as each individual hero has their own strengths and weaknesses and it generally requires skills to play every single hero. The second strategy that works really well is time versus money. And this covers everything where you are able to do something faster or you can do something right now instead of waiting by spending money. This mechanic we find in almost all social games. A classical example would be Candy Crush Saga, where you can choose to wait, you can spam your friends, or you can pay to continue playing right now. I personally believe that the reason this works very well is that it's easy for people to relate to. It's much easier to explain to a user that not waiting for 30 minutes is worth $1 than it is to explain that they should use the same dollar to buy a, an amount of virtual gold. Last but not least, we have consumables. Basically, things you can buy and use only a few times or even once. Again, I'm using a classical example. This time, it's single Ruby Blast game, where you can select and buy power-ups to use once every time you start a new game. While looking at all of these games, I also found the following two strategies that never really seems to work for anyone. The first of these are visual-only customization, something you buy that only changes the look of what you have. An example would be bigger tires in a multiplayer racing game. However, I also found that if you combine these visual changes with a real power-up, say making the car slightly faster, it will sell more than just selling the power-up alone. The second is selling content. For instance, only allowing the user to play the first three levels of your game then forcing them to pay if they want to play more. These insights into what makes money gives us rule number four, which is focus on core monetization. I found for the close to 100 games I looked at that the three good strategies accounted for almost 80% of the total revenue. Therefore, you're much better off focusing on the few core monetization strategies than you are trying to add as many different ways of making money as possible. Another very interesting thing I found while looking at the games is that engagement seems to drive monetization. What I mean by that is that the longer a player plays a game, the higher the chance there is that the player will pay inside the games. Thinking about that afterwards, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, imagine that you design a game that takes 8 hours to complete. This can be done in a total of one to four game sessions and suddenly you only have eight hours of total time and one to four game sessions to convince the user that they should pay. A really powerful way to see this in the last end is to look at transaction volume. Here we can see that the top 10% of players who play the game the most account for a whole 30% of the total paid transactions. Even more impressive, the 10% that play the game the most account for 61% of the total revenue. From that data directly, we can conclude our final and fifth rule, which is build a service. Instead of the game being something a user can finish, my suggestion is that you design a gameplay mechanic that allows people to play forever. So I used a lot of time talking about The Last Stand Dead Zone. Let's look at what that game actually is. And to do that, I was lucky enough to get a set of slides from Chris Condon, who did a presentation on the game at Flash Gaming Summit. And I can highly recommend watching that session if you want more information about the game. The game can quickly be described as an asynchronous multiplayer zombie defense game. Every player has a base, I can go visit other people's bases, I can attack them, or I can help my friends. To collect resources, I had to collect survivors. I can get up to 10 survivors, and I can take these survivors on skirmishes. And on these skirmishes, I collect resources and other things that I need to continuously improve my base. The first version of the game was built by a small four-man team with Chris Condon in charge. Chris being a jack of all trades, him having an additional programmer, a dedicated 3D artist, and a third programmer to help out. The very first thing Chris did when starting out on this game was write a design document. 
This document not only included how the game was going to be played, but also included the monetization strategy. During this design process, Chris decided that most of the gameplay and thereby most of the monetization was going to be around loot, things you were able to collect in the game. When the game first shipped, it had almost 40,000 different loot items you could get. To make this insane amount of items possible, they created 70 base weapons with 20 different prefixes and then randomly generated most of the items. Chris is lucky enough to have built a fair amount of successful games before The Last Stand Dead Zone. Among these are three pre-existing The Last Stand games, so The Last Stand Game Zone is the fourth in a series. This allowed Chris to very efficiently have a teaser campaign for the next generation of The Last Stand series. By posting this teaser campaign on the The Last Stand blog, on the Conazis game forums and on Facebook, Chris was able to generate enough hype and get enough beta users to actually test out the newest generation of the game without buying any users. So let's talk about how the game actually makes money. Instead of building the economy around something that has real world value such as gold or gems, Chris decided to build the economy around fuel. In the game players are able to find this fuel for free, however there is very tight control of the flow of free fuel where you will only be able to find a certain amount of fuel in a specific amount of time. And a big learning experience Chris and its team has is that more is more. If they decrease the amount of free fuel given out, their revenue would also decrease. By using analytics, Chris and his team was able to determine that the two things that works the best for his games are one, supply boxes. A supply box is a box containing random items and to open the supply box you need to buy a key. There are several different kinds of supply boxes and keys and the more rare a supply box is, the more interesting loot it will contain and the more expensive the key to open the supply box is. The second thing Chris and his team learned from analytics is that they would get a huge increase in conversion by selling packages containing both fuel and items rather than just outright selling fuel. However, they also found that they had introduced a too powerful permanent power-up. In this case, the Deathmobile, which uh, decreases the return time of any mission to 5 minutes. So even though this power-up has a price of almost $15, all hardcore users have purchased it and it has prevented con artist games from monetizing missions on almost all the hardcore users. The state of the game today is that it has been in development for more than a year. It's just about ready to go out of beta, but already by having good cross promotion and releasing on Armor Games and Congregate, the game has 250,000 monthly active users. Today it makes $96,000 a month in revenue. That's $1.152 million a year the lesson here is that if you design your game well, if you focus on your core monetization, optimize your payments using analytics and build your game as a service, there is a very good chance that you are able to build a million dollar a year game as well. Thank you. If you have questions, feedback or comments or just want to talk, feel free to send me an email at chris at player.io.